You can open your Bible to Revelation 6 again this morning, if you would. We're going to cover... Uh, going to cover a lot of uh, ground this morning. Uh, not here, not here. We're only going to stay in verses 1 and 2, but, but elsewhere on the screen uh, today, I'm going to give you a lot of verses. So if you take notes, these are things you might want to write down. Go back and check them out if, if that's what you desire to, uh, to do. So uh, that's where we're going to go, and, I'm, and I'll show you here in a moment. But last week, here's what we did. We stepped into Revelation chapter 6, and we stepped into verses 1 and 2. When the first seal was opened, Jesus took the, the scroll in, in chapter 5, which is the title deed to the earth, and in chapter 6, he opened up the first scroll, or the first seal. Whenever he opened up the first seal, there was uh, a white horse that came forth. There are going to be four horses of what many refer to as the the four horses of the apocalypse and we'll we'll look at those as a group here as we go through uh, but whenever that first seal was opened up uh, we talked all about the fact that that there was a rider on a white horse watch verse 2 let me just read it for you it says this and I saw and behold a white horse and he that sat on him had a bow and a crown was given unto him and went forth conquering and to conquer so we're going to go back to that this morning. We're going to go elsewhere, as I said, and we're going to really our focus today is going to be on the Antichrist and, and on the ways in which he's going to work in the, uh, the tribulation period whenever he comes on the face of the earth. But I want to lap back for a second, and I want to do this. I want to reinforce something that I said last week, and I've said it over and over again, but I want you to get this. It, this is after sitting in Dale's class on Thursday night and listening to his teaching and in some news that had trickled back to me uh, throughout the week that just, it, it really, some things really shocked me that I had heard about. And so I wanted to just reinforce this because I want you to make sure that you have this in your mind. We as the church are not going to go through the tribulation period. If you know Jesus Christ is your Savior and you are saved, we are not going to go through the tribulation period. And I believe the Bible is crystal clear about that. When talking to the churches, Jesus said these words in Revelation 3.10, Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour, not in, but from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them, that dwell upon the earth. Jesus promised the church that we would not go through that period, okay? But you have to still, at the same time, you have to uh, understand that Israel, the nation of Israel, is going to go through that tribulation period. And, and last week we looked at this, and I want to go back to this for a moment. 70, this is what Gabriel told to Daniel about that about prophecy he said this 70 weeks are determined upon thy people now the the emphasis that i want to make there is on the fact that gabriel said on thy people daniel's people are the jews it, daniel's people are not the church okay you understand that with this this doesn't have anything to do with you and i okay the 70 weeks were determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and the prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Okay, so what he said was this, and he would later give the details, that from the time that Nehemiah was given the command to go and to rebuild the walls around the city of Jerusalem, it would be 70 weeks of years until the kingdom of Jesus Christ will be set up. But what Daniel didn't understand, and none of the Old Testament people understood, was that there would be 69 weeks of years, and then there would be a gap. Let me show you something. Daniel 24, 25, and 26a. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem... That was the commandment given to Nehemiah. From that commandment 
until the print messiah the prince until the coming of the messiah shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks that's 69 weeks of years okay now stay with me the street shall be built again the wall even in troublous times and after now watch this one and after three score and two weeks after those 69 weeks shall messiah be cut off okay now here's what gabriel said he said 69 weeks of years daniel there are 70 weeks determined on your pay, on your people but after 69 weeks the messiah is going to come jesus christ is going to come and last week i told you that's why on palm sunday that jesus wept because he said you should have known this day that if they would have taken that mathematical prophecy and they would have figured it out on the jewish calendar they could have known the very day that their messiah was going to come into jerusalem and they missed it they missed it but he all oh, daniel said gabriel says this that after those 69 weeks the messiah would be cut off meaning that he would die he would be crucified okay now one would think that 70th week would pick up right after the 69th week but that's not what happens there is a gap and in that gap right now that gap has been about 2,000 years and we are in that gap and that's known as the age of grace or the church age and so what's going on right now is God is gathering a bride for his children or for his for his son he's gathering a bride together we are known as the bride of Christ the church is okay when that bride is complete unannounced imminently Christ is going to come back no no forewarning no sign needs to take place in the church those that know Christ as Savior we're going to be raptured away just like that taken off the face of the earth that fits very well with the Jewish wedding because what would happen with a Jewish wedding and I'll just give it to you real brief because it's not in my notes and I don't want to get too far into that but but there would be a betrothal period whenever a, a, a man and a woman would be betrothed or engaged while they were engaged the man would go back and he would build a place for his bride and the bride had to keep herself pure she had to wait she waited and she looked every single day not knowing when that place was going to be complete and then he would come unannounced and then he would gather her up and then they would go and they would go through the wedding ceremony that fits perfectly well with the teaching of the rapture that's exactly what's going to happen okay jesus said in john 14 i go to prepare a place for you so he went away to prepare a place and then he said to his disciples he said i'm going to come back again and then he said these words i want you to listen to him that where i am there ye may be also he didn't say where you are i'm going to be because we're not looking for jesus to come and set up his kingdom here so that he can be with us here on this earth he said where i am there ye shall be meaning that we're going to be raptured away we're going to be caught up we're going to be taken away and so whenever that event happens then the world goes into the tribulation period and now god's not focused on the nation of israel they have been set aside but in that tribulation period he's going to go back and he's going to work with the nation of israel again i emphasize that for this reason and, I, and i'm going to borrow some of what dale talked about on thursday night and things that i read later on in the week and and that was this that there are people today that believe the tribulation is over it already happened it's done they believe that we are in the millennial kingdom right now and jesus is on the throne in heaven and that he's ruling right now and there is not going to be a tribulation period listen they believe the church replaced the nation of israel don't you for a moment buy into that don't and there are churches around this area that are into that that's what dale talked about thursday covenant theology don't you dare get into that don't you dare buy into that because listen 
God is not done with the nation of Israel. He's working with us now. When the church is complete, we're raptured away. Then God's going to go back and he's going to work with the nation of Israel. And I'm telling you this right now, there is a tribulation period that is coming. There is a tribulation period far worse than anything that has ever come on the face of the earth as we shall see as we continue our study of the book of Revelation. I needed to give you that because I care about you and I don't want to see you get caught up in this new teaching that is out there. Don't you dare. Don't, don't, don't lend an ear to it. Be very, very careful about that. That's another message. But anyhow, let me go to the first point that we're going to look at, and it's a continuation. It's seal number one, part two, is what we're going to talk about. And we're going to focus today on the Antichrist. This is who we're going to focus on. I'm going to read uh, verse two one more time, and I'll just refresh your memory on this if I could. Now watch this. And I saw and behold a white horse, and we talked about the white horse last week. In Revelation 19, Jesus comes on a white horse. Here, the Antichrist comes on a white horse. This is not Jesus. Jesus comes at the end. This is at the beginning, okay? So he comes, the Antichrist comes on a white horse because he is a counterfeit. He's going to counterfeit what God has promised. He's going to, well, I'll get into that in a little bit. Hang on, now watch this. And I saw and behold a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow. The bow speaks of power. power. The man will be extremely, extremely powerful whenever he comes on the scene. Okay, watch the, watch the verse again. He that sat on him had a bow and a crown. Okay, he's victorious. A crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and a conquer. Ultimately, here's what he's going to do. He's going to come, and he's going to rule the world. He is going to be a one-world ruler. He will be extremely powerful politically speaking, okay? He will have by his side a man known as the false prophet. So he is going to control the religious system of the world also. When he comes, here's what he's going to do. He's going to come in a peaceful way. He is going, he is going to do this. He's going to counterfeit, and I don't want to go back to all this. He's going to counterfeit what God had promised to the nation of Israel and that was this, that, that, that he would establish peace on the earth for them, ultimately in the kingdom, in the coming kingdom after the seven years of tribulation. Okay, so Satan is going to, or the Antichrist is going to come. He's going to be fueled by Satan. He's going to be empowered by Satan. And he is going to come, and whenever he comes on the scene, he's going to come in a very peaceful manner. And people are going to love him. They're going to love him. The fact that he's on a white horse, we didn't get into this last year, but in the Old Testament, in the, in the, Bible, in the biblical days, when a, when a general or a, somebody that was out at war, when they came back riding on a white horse, that showed that they were victorious. And whenever they were victorious, the people loved them. They basically worshipped them. That's exactly what we're going to have here. That's what the world is going to experience whenever the tribulation period begins. So he is going to counterfeit the peace that God promised. But now I want you to listen to this. God will not permit that peace to exist because whenever we come to the second seal, it's interesting that the next seal, and we'll get that next week, will be the outbreak of war. God will not permit. He is a counterfeit, but God is not going to permit him to set up the peace like God had promised. So, so there's going to be another horse, and it's going to be given to him by, through, through God to be able to make war on the face of the earth. So, so while he sets up this peace, it's not going to last. It's not going to last. But one of the things that the Antichrist is going to do is this, because this is something that God had promised. He's going to make a covenant with the nation of Israel, and he's going to promise that he will protect them. That's what he's going to promise. He's going to make that covenant for seven years with them. In the middle of the seven years, that would be three and a half years deep, after he comes on the scene, after that covenant is established, after those three and a half years, he is going to break the covenant with Israel. Let me show you something. Daniel talked about it. Daniel 9, 27. And he, the Antichrist, shall confirm the covenant with many for one 
week. That's a week of years. That's seven years. Okay, he's going to establish that covenant. And in the midst of the week, three and a half years deep, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the, for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate even unto the consummation. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. He's going to break that covenant in the middle of that seven-year period. And whenever he breaks that covenant, that starts what is known as the great tribulation because then tribulation is going to come on the world like the world has never known before jesus spoke about all this in matthew chapter 24 watch this he said when ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation that's the antichrist spoken of by daniel the prophet stand in the holy place Whosoever readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee unto the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. Verse 21. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. So in the middle of the tribulation period, he is going to break the covenant and that's when the great tribulation period is going to begin paul spoke of the very same thing in first thessalonians 5 1 through 3. he said this right after he talked about the rapture in chapter 4 and explained to them about the rapture and then he says this in, in chapter 5 he says but of the times and seasons brethren you have no need that i write unto you for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so come as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, peace and safety, they're crying out, peace and safety, watch this. Then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. That is what's coming. The Antichrist will come on a scene. He will come in a peaceful way, a very peaceful way. He will become a world ruler. I believe this. I believe he will have the answers to a lot of the questions in the world today. He will have a way in which to settle things down. You've got to understand this, and, and we don't know when he's going to come. We don't know the rapture is imminent. There's nothing that has to happen before that takes place. There are no signs before the rapture. But I'll say this, it sure looks like the stage is set with all the tension that is in the world today. The stage is being set for that period to come, for a world ruler to come on a scene to establish a peace in the world, to set up a, a covenant with the nation of Israel for seven years. The guy could be alive today, but we will not know him. You and I will not be introduced to him if you know Christ is your Savior. If you don't, you will. If you don't, and, and the rapture happens, you'll learn who that guy is. You'll know who the world ruler is because you'll get left behind. Okay, now, here's what I want to do. Before we go to the next seal, the second seal, and that'll be next week, I want to get a little bit further into the Antichrist. And I want to... There are so many verses and there are so many references, and, and we're not going to exhaust this topic by any means but but i want to show you I, I have this dated wrong or labeled wrong i have it as character i changed that up this morning in reading through this and and i'd like to change that to his ways not his character we know his character is going to be fueled by satan but i want to i want you to consider his ways with me how he's going to function what he's going to do what, what's it what's he going to do whenever he comes on the scene how's he going to operate what's his what's his goal going to be in all of this and I want you to listen to what I'm going to tell you. And i got to take you on a journey. I want to take you on a journey. And I'm going to start on the screen here. I'm going to take you back to Genesis. In the book of Genesis, in chapter 3, you know this because we studied the book. If you were here, or the first 11 chapters, we've studied the book. But recently we did the first 11 chapters. But, but in Genesis 3, sin enters into the world. Mankind is... is, is plunged into sin 
born sinners because of the sin that took place in Genesis chapter 3. And in Genesis chapter 3, God pronounces the curse on mankind. What the woman is going to experience, the pain through childbirth, her husband's going to rule over her, what the man is going to experience, the monotony of life, the tears of life, the struggle to, to uh, make ends meet in life, so to speak. He's given all of that. But then he speaks to, God speaks to the serpent, and he says this. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and thus shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now, if you've been here, you know this. You know very well that that verse 15 is the first promise of a future redeemer, the seed of the woman. You know that, and Satan knew that it was a man because at the end of verse 15 it says, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So it would be a man that would come on the scene. Satan would bruise his heel, would bruise the heel of the redeemer at the cross, but ultimately the redeemer would bruise the head of Satan. And the word bruise there means to crush, ultimately defeat him. Okay, now listen to me. Satan knew that from Eve there was going to come a man, but he didn't know who it would be. He knew that there would be a man that would be the redeemer that God said would ultimately destroy him. So right after that, you find Cain killing Abel. Why? Because Abel was a righteous individual. He was a prophet, the Bible tells us. And I believe that Satan believed that through Abel, that promise right there might be fulfilled. So he causes Cain to rise up, and Cain kills Abel. And it makes it look like Satan won, and like he defeated that. And then we go on in Genesis, and we find out that, that it says this, and God gave Adam and Eve another seed besides Abel, and that seed was Seth. And so that shows us that, that God's promise couldn't be defeated. And so Seth went on, and, and, and Satan still had no idea, no idea who this man would be. And so he attacks the human race. And in, and in Genesis chapter 6, he attacked them, and he, and he did that by 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 corrupting the entire world okay so now let me let me back up because i almost got ahead of myself on something so eve dies her children die and he still doesn't know he still doesn't know who that redeemer is going to be but there is also in the bible another way to look at genesis three fifteen. Watch the verse again right there on the screen. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now the woman no doubt refers to Eve, but also prophetically speaking refers to the nation of Israel. Hmm, interesting. That from the nation of Israel, there would come a seed you think that's not the case let me just show you revelation 12 1 through 5 watch this and there appeared a great wonder in heaven a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of 12 stars and she being with child cried travailing in birth and pained to be delivered and there appeared another wonder in heaven and behold a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads and his tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne. It's a reference to Christ. The woman there is a reference to the nation of Israel. So I'd like to say this to you, that I believe Satan understood that from the nation of Israel would come the Redeemer. But, but, 
after Eve died, after Cain killed Abel, Seth was raised up and, and, and it went on and, and Satan didn't know who was going to be the redeemer and so he focused on the world's population and in Genesis chapter 6 he sold, he sold to the world's population, he sold a false religion. He sold them a false religion and they began to follow after this false religion. Ultimately, it corrupted the entire world and God destroyed the world with a flood, but he kept alive the promise of a redeemer through Noah and through his offspring. And so, so the flood goes, the, 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 the ark lands and Noah gets out and, and, and whenever he gets out, they began to multiply and they began to populate again. And so Satan's got to come up with another plan and so in Genesis chapter 10, we see something that begins to happen. If you're not careful, you can read over it. But here it is in Genesis 10, 8 and 10. And it says, and Cush begat Nimrod. Then it says this about Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. Let me tell you about Nimrod. He was what we would call a natural born leader. People just followed him. He had something about him. He was just a natural born leader. And so he had a way that, 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 that he could lead people. Verse 9 says this, he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. A mighty hunter. Uh, years ago, I used to think, boy, that, when I was into archery hunting and all that stuff, I used to think, wow, this guy must have been something. You know, he was a mighty hunter. And then I come to find out that he didn't hunt deer and he didn't hunt animals. And so to speak, he hunted men. He hunted men. Not to kill them. No, 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 no. He didn't hunt men to kill them, though that was probably uh, some of what he did, no doubt, because you got to understand something. Nimrod here is a type of the Antichrist. But I want to use this, and I want to show you how his ways are going to work. So, so he's a mighty hunter before the Lord. Let me keep reading. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. In the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, Babel and Erech and Akkad and Kalna in the land of Shinar. Keep that right here. The beginning of his kingdom, the beginning of the kingdom of Nimrod was in the land of Shinar. Now let me advance you a little bit. Let me take you to Genesis 11, 1 through 4. Watch this. And the whole earth was of one language and one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of, here it is, Shinar. That's where Nimrod's kingdom is. And they dwelt there. And they said one to another, go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime had they for mortar. And they said, go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven and let us make us a name lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. So here is the entire world's population, so to speak. They are headed up, no doubt, because they're in the land of Shinar, which is where Nimrod's kingdom was. They are headed up by one man. And that man is Nimrod. They decide they get in the land of Shinar and they dwelt there and they say, we don't want to be scattered all abroad across the face of the earth. So we're going to build us a city and we're going to build us a tower. Then the tower is going to reach unto heaven. Now listen, they were smarter than to think that they could build a tower that went up to where God's person was, so to speak. They're not going up into the third heaven. They knew better than that. It's not what it means. They built a ziggurat. That was a, a tower that was used for a false religion. It's interesting that, and we don't have time to do all this, and this would take a lot of time, to go back and find out that that's, if you go back there, that was, that was originally in the, the, the land of Babylon. That's where the start of the worship of the mother of God came from. Religions today follow right along that same way. But anyhow, that's not here nor there. 
So they build this tower, and there they decide they're going to worship. They're going to enter into this false worship system, and they're going to stay there. And we know what happened. God came down. He, he, he uh, changed their language, and it became known as the Tower of Babel, and they all ended up going their own way. But here's what I want you to understand. Nimrod hunted people to follow after him. They ended up, they came and they, they dwelt in the land of Shinar where his kingdom was. They decided that they were going to build a tower and they didn't want to be scattered abroad. This is all in rebellion. It's all in rebellion against God. Because God had given them a command. In Genesis 9-1, we read this, And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth. It was supposed to spread out across the face of the earth is exactly what they were going to do. So Nimrod got them all together so that they could rebel. He hunted down people. He went and he, and he forced people to follow after him so that they would rebel against God. Now listen, he is a picture of the Antichrist. So you know this, when you take those facts from Nimrod and you bring them in and, and you bring them and you apply them and you put them down beside the Antichrist, we know this, that he's going to function. He's, his ways are going to be exactly the same. He's going to come on the scene. He's going to come in a peaceful way. He's going to be very powerful with his leadership skills, with his speech, with politically speaking, and he's going to be a hunter of people. And he is going to, Satan's going to empower him. Remember, he's the masterpiece of Satan. And, and through him, Satan is going to deceive so many people to follow after him and to follow after. Listen, just like Nimrod set up a false worship system, so the Antichrist is going to do the very same thing. Only he's going to go further and he's going to claim to be God. And he's going to do miracles and he's going to do wonders and he's going to call down fire from the sky and he's going to do it under the power of satan but he's going to hunt people down to follow him that's the kind of guy he's going to be but whenever he comes on the scene he won't appear to be that way but through his methods through his deceitfulness he's going to hook a lot of people and he's going to pull in a lot and i want to show you just a glimpse of the people that are going to follow him. You've heard of this. You've heard of the Battle of Armageddon. The Battle of Armageddon is going to take place at the end of the tribulation period, whenever Jesus Christ returns. There are three references to it in the book of Revelation that I believe that are there. Let me show you something. Revelation 19, 19 through 21. Revelation 19 is whenever Jesus comes back on a white horse. And it says this, And I saw the beast, that's the Antichrist, and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. They're gathered together to make war against Jesus Christ and you and I that return with Christ. Watch it. And the beast was taken. This just kind of cuts right to the chase here. And the beast was taken and with him, the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. We'll get into the mark of the beast and all of that later. These both were cast alive in the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse. That was the sword of Christ. Which sword proceeded out, proceedeth, proceeded out of his mouth? and of the fowls which were filled with their flesh, are destroyed with the word of God. I believe this. Jesus speaks the word and they're dead. They're killed. They're done. Okay? You say, are they all just laying on the ground dead? Just no, that's it. They just, just call one word and, and they're laid out. No, I think there's more to it than that. Let me show you this. Let me back you up a little bit. Another reference to it, Revelation 14. Watch this one. 18 through 20. And another angel came out from the altar which had power over fire and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the wine of the earth, 
for her grapes are fully ripe. We'll get into all this whenever we get there. I want to get you to the end. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth, and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden without the city, and blood, watch this, came out of the winepress, even unto the horse bridles, by the space of a thousand six hundred furlongs. Listen to this. For, you want to know how many people are going to follow the Antichrist. Remember, he's Nimrod. He's a hunter of men. And, and it's just a picture of what's coming. And he's going to gather these armies together to fight against Christ. We don't, we're not told the amount of people that are going to follow after him. But we're told about the blood from the battle. It's four and a half feet deep. Four and a half feet deep. It's probably right about there. Okay? And the river of that blood's 180 miles long. Four and a half feet deep, 180 miles long is the river of blood. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of people. That's why, come on back to 6 2 in Revelation again. Let me show you something. And I saw and behold a white horse. He that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him. The crown, he's victorious. He's victorious in, 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 in leading people, in gathering people, and hunting people, and in, in getting them to join up with him. And he went forth conquering and to conquer. And I think that not only that there are going to be people that voluntarily sign up, but there are going to be people also that are forced to sign up because in that day, if you don't have the mark of the beast, you won't, the, if you're left behind and you don't have the mark of the beast, you won't be able to eat and you won't be able to buy and you won't be able to sell. You won't be able to do that. Let me, let me make something clear. Today, there's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of speculation about the mark of the beast. There's a lot of it. You know, today they're putting, they're, they're going around and they're putting chips in people, you know, those computerized, those little, computerized chips so that they can scan you here or there. You got credit cards that have chips in. And so the, the, the hype is this, that boy, that's it. That's the mark of the beast. No, can't be impossible, impossible. Let me tell you why. Because every one of the chips that they use is different. It's got your information on. And I'm not, I mean, I'm not saying you got one in you. If you do, that's up to you. But if you have a chip, it's got your info on. If I would have a chip, it's got my information on. The mark of the beast is the same. Six, six, six. It's not different. Not only that, the mark of the beast has to be visible. And I could take you, and we're going to go there as we go through this, but I could take you back to the first mark put on an individual. Anybody know who it was put on? Cain. Cain. It was a visible mark. So will the mark of the beast be a visible mark. Don't, don't, don't think that that computer chip is the mark of the beast. It's not. It's not. There's going to be a mark that's going to be the same on every individual person that shows that that person is a follower of the Antichrist. Okay, so anyhow, all that said to say this that there are going to be people that they can't, they can't get any food, they can't sell anything, they can't work, they can't do anything unless they have the mark of the beast. So they're going to be forced. A lot of them are going to be forced. They may not want to, but they're going to be forced to take the mark so that they can survive. So through that and through uh, people that voluntarily buy into the deception of the Antichrist, the, the people that he gathers are going to be tremendous in number, frightening in number of the people that are going to follow that. You've got to realize there's so much to take in account here. Remember this, the restrainer's gone. And, and the restrainer's the, or the, the, restrainer's the Holy Spirit in the, in the sense of being in a church. And so the, when the restrainer's taken away, the demonic forces, the demonic spirits that today are restrained and bound, so to speak, they can only go as far as what God will permit. And that day, they're going to be released. You and I wouldn't stand a chance 
in a mind battle with Satan. You wouldn't stand a chance in that. He's extremely powerful, extremely knowledgeable. He knows the Bible from the front to the back. That's why he doesn't want us studying the book of Revelation, because the book of Revelation tells of his destruction. That's why there were some people that came here. Uh, 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 it's been a while, but they came here whenever we were just into chapter 5, I think, or chapter 4. I don't know. I think it was chapter 5, but that's not here nor there. And they said this to me. They said, we're afraid of that book. And they've never come back. That's satanic. And I told them that. I said, that's satanic. God promises a blessing to the teacher and to the students. The only book that's listed at that. But there are people that are scared to death of this book because Satan has caused them to live in fear because in that book it tells about the kingdom and it tells about how Satan's going to be destroyed. And he doesn't want us to know that. He doesn't want us to know that. He doesn't want us to know that, it's, that, that all of this is coming and that God is victorious. So he casts fear into people. And you see it today. What's it going to be like after the rapture when the restraints are lifted? What's it going to be like? Far worse than anything we can ever begin to imagine. And God gives, God gives like, like whenever we get next week, whenever we go into that second seal and that rider is, is given power to make war. You, know, you got to understand, God's letting this go on. He's not going to let Satan run out there with a peace treaty that is an exact duplicate of what he has promised. No, no, no. He's not going to do that. And so war's going to come and famine's going to come and persecution's going to come. And these are birth pangs. We'll get to that maybe next week. But let me reel you back in here. I told you there's a lot here. There's so much to consider in all of this, and, I, and it makes me want to teach it, and, and i got to be careful because uh, my wife's not in here to give me the eye that says I'm about done, but I know she's looking at the monitor in the nursery, so I'll be careful. I'll get it on the way home. Let, let me reel you back in, okay? Before the day of the Lord comes, there are two things that got to happen. Now, I'm not saying the rapture. I'm not saying that. No, no, no. Before the day of the Lord, before the tribulation begins, two things got to occur. I want to take you, and here's where I'm going to end you out today. 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 3 says this. Now, we beseech you, brethren. You remember, these people, these people here, the Thessalonian believers were going through persecution that was really severe, and, and they thought they had missed a rapture. That's what they thought. And, and they had been around. Paul wrote 1 Thessalonians to them, and, and he had taught them that the church wasn't going to go through the rapture. So you can just imagine why they're shaken up and why they're terrified. They would have thought, boy, we missed it. We must not have been saved. So he writes this right here, and he says this. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. That's the rapture. You got that? Okay. Christ coming back in the sky and by our gathering together unto him, not him coming down here where we're at. Okay, so he's, he's talking about the rapture. That you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled. Don't be confused. Don't be terrified, neither by spirit nor by word. People going around saying, well, we're going through the tribulation period or whatever, as, or nor by a letter as from us. Apparently somebody had wrote a letter and forged Paul's name and and confused them a whole lot, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Then he says this, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come. That's the day of Christ. That's the tribulation period. Except there come a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. So he tells them that there are two things that need to take place. Number one, there has to be a falling away. And number two, there has to be the revelation of the Antichrist. And the revelation of the Antichrist is not going to come until after the church is gone because the restrainer is holding him back. But I want to talk to you about the falling away. I'd like to submit this to you, that we are living in a day today where that falling away is occurring, without a doubt. Where there are false doctrines that are taught in churches, leading people away but but this refers to an apostasy 
This, this refers to a direct turning away from the truth. That's what it is. It's a direct turning away from the truth. It's, it, and it's going on today. There are churches today, and I'll, I'll just say it for what it is, uh, that have come in and they, have, they say that homosexuality is fine. Let me tell you what that is. That is, a, that is a direct turning away from the truth of what God's Word says. There are churches that used to be rock solid, rock solid, and now they're full of rock and roll, and they're full of everything else that the world has to offer. And so what they're doing, they're, they're turning away from the truth. I heard Gary talk this morning about we are to be a peculiar people. We're different. We're unique. We're not to be like the world. We're not to be like the world. But the, but the, but the, the, the word, the, a lot of churches today are watering down the truth of God's word. They're staying away from anything that offends people. And so they are, they are trying to be appealing to the world. And so what you have today is you have an apostasy. You have a deliberate turning away from the truth of the Word of God, whether it be to please people, whether it be just to have a soft presentation, whatever it might be, whether to, to, to be labeled as somebody that's tolerant because they don't want to get labeled as a bigot or intolerant or whatever. And, and so they don't, they're, they're not preaching the gospel. They're not telling us, they're not telling anybody that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. They won't narrow it down. They won't take what Jesus said. They won't say that there is not salvation in any other except Jesus Christ. They won't say it. And so they're turning away from the truth. And I'd just like to submit to you that that falling away is going on today. It's going on today. And uh, we don't know when the rapture is. I don't know when it is. I think uh, somebody predicted it was yesterday. It didn't happen. The world was going to end this and that, and the, the stars were all lining up. And don't buy into that stuff. That's junk, garbage, theology, theological word, hogwash. That's about what it is. But anyhow, but I just want to say this. You don't know when the rapture is going to happen, and neither do I. We don't. It's imminent. It can happen at any time. But, but I want to say this. If you miss the rapture, you're going into the tribulation period. Let me, let me just present this to you, and then I'm going to let you go. If you know Christ today, if you're saved today, boy, we got to hope that if the rapture happens, I don't have to die. Now, I, I'll be like one guy. One guy said this. I'm not afraid to die. I just don't want to be there whenever it happens. It's about how we are, aren't we? You know? I mean, not that we don't have to fear death, but it, there, there is that, we never walked that path before, we never went through that door, so we just don't know what to expect. But the thought of not having to die and, and just hearing the words of Jesus, whatever they might be, come up here, whatever they are, and to think that I don't have to die, man, that's great. And I hold on to that, and I look forward to the fact that the rapture could happen in my lifetime. But you know, if you, if you miss that, if you're not saved and you go into the tribulation, you don't have that. You don't have it. Your only hope is this, that, that you'll die to escape what we're about to talk about, but it'll be no escape at all because you'll be plunged into hell. Understand that? The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Jesus died to pay the penalty for your sins and for mine. You're a sinner. And until your sins are washed away by the blood of Christ, you're not going to get into God's presence. You won't do it. Christ died to set you free from the power, the penalty, and eventually the presence of sin. But you've got to accept him as your Savior. I'm telling you this right now. We've not even cracked into it very far, but you don't want to be here. You do not want to be here when that tribulation period begins. Oh, it might start out fine. It might start out fine. But it's not going to be very long before the birth pangs are going to start. And the squeeze is going to begin. 
and the tribulation is going to come and the judgment's going to come and it's going to be so terrible that people are going to want to die and they won't be able to die if you're left behind you're going to live into that you'll die somewhere along the line there mark my word either that or at the end you'll just be taken away in judgment listen Christ died for you. If you have any questions about your salvation, here's what I want you to do. Come to me afterwards. I don't want to see you left behind. I might not be here next week because if the rapture happens this week, I'm not going to be here. I'm not going to be here. You need to be saved today. You need to. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. <clears throat> thank you for the truth that is revealed in your word. Lord, we covered a lot of ground. There's a a lot of things to think about, but ultimately we get the picture of a little bit of what that tribulation period, how it's going to start out with the Antichrist coming and coming in a peaceful way, a bow with no arrows, but yet with the bow, lots and tremendous amount of power in the man, power politically, power religiously, uh, financially. Lord, it's just going to be a lot. And He's going to be a hunter of men. He's going to lead men against you, against the return of Jesus Christ. Father, I thank you for this. For those of us that know Christ as Savior, that our hope is and our promise is this, that we will not go through that period. I thank you for the hope that we could be raptured away and, and before that ever begins. But, Lord, I'd like to pray for those here that don't know Christ, that have, that have, that have said no to him. And, and, Lord, help them to realize it's like they're walking on a rotten net over hell right now. And at any moment, the next step could plunge them through to the fires of hell. And if that rapture occurs, then they enter into that tribulation period, the worst period ever, as Jesus said, to come on the face of the earth. So I pray that they would not be able to leave here today till they would seek me out or one of the other leaders that would show them the way of salvation. So, Father, I'll commit this to you. Pray, Father, you take the message, you use it for your honor and for your glory. In Jesus' name I pray.